we see our Lord uses a particular approach to interpreting Scripture. Now certainly we should then follow that example, but also I would add to that we should be following the example of the apostles who were inspired to provide an interpretation of our Lord's ministry. There's not a time zone in which he's not being praised. Listen to me, there is not a moment since the resurrection of Jesus where there's not someone somewhere declaring that Jesus saved. Welcome to God's Lawyer Podcast. I'm Pastor T.J. Francis. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church of Dover, Florida. And in this episode of The Brief, we're going to talk about a big word, a big concept, and hopefully simplify it. That is hermeneutics. What is hermeneutics? Well, hermeneutics is simply the science of interpretation. Now, some might say that interpretation is more of an art. Well, I do think that there is an art to communicating the Word of God, but I do believe that it is more of a science when we talk about interpreting it. And you say science, what do you mean by science? Now, sometimes we think of science, we think of a, of a laboratory where there's chemicals involved or maybe uh, we're looking under a microscope at something. But science, really the word science, it means the knowledge or the pursuit of knowledge. And we understand it also as a discipline, as a way of approaching something. We say we approach something scientifically. In other words, what we're saying is that there are, there are rules that people use when interpreting the scripture. So I want to talk about some basic hermeneutics. Now, as we get into that, I realize that it can be a little intimidating. What most of us have been exposed to over the years, at least what I've noticed in a Baptist church, uh, I've been in a Baptist church most of my life, but as a pastor over 20 years, what I've noticed is the default approach to interpreting the Bible has been, well, that's just how I read it, or that's what it means to me. That approach does this. It starts with a belief, then it goes into the Bible to support that belief, or sometimes really doesn't even go into the Bible. A lot of times people will have beliefs and they'll hold to them without really any scriptural basis or merit. Or you'll see sometimes someone will come to a text and that text may present something contrary to what they already believe and then they've been trained to go and find another text or another verse that allegedly supports their belief and they'll use it to counter that verse. As I've mentioned in other podcasts before, that brings into repute the inerrancy and inspiration of the scripture. I don't think that's how we should approach the study of the Bible. Let's talk about some basics. As we do that, I want to remind you of a key passage in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27 when we hear this. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them and all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now that's the Lord Jesus who's providing an interpretation of the Old Testament. So we find our Lord practicing hermeneutics. In fact, if we take that same chapter, Luke chapter 24, and we go over just a few verses into verse 44, we hear this. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. We see our Lord uses a particular approach to interpreting scripture. Now certainly we should then follow that example, but also I would add to that we should be following the example of the apostles who were inspired to provide an interpretation of our Lord's ministry. Certainly when we read Luke, we recognize that Luke was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write his gospel, and his gospel is an interpretation of Jesus and his ministry. And in that interpretation, he's providing us an exposure to how Jesus interpreted the Old Testament. We see that method, that approach carrying over into the book of Hebrews. So let's talk about this as a, if you will, as an everyday Christian, we might say as a lay person, how would you go about studying and interpreting the Bible? Because it can be intimidating. I mean, there's a lot to talk about when you get into it. Hermeneutics can be an extremely complex discipline. Uh, there are a number of approaches, variations, and when you get into it, suddenly you realize, like any other discipline, as you start into it, you're humbled by the fact that the minute you pursue studying hermeneutics, you start realizing how much you really don't know, and it can feel overwhelming. But for the everyday person who, who loves the Lord, wants to read and understand God's Word as they're seeking to, to live their life, 
and uh, love their family, lead their family, what's that look like? Well, I think it's important for us to understand genres. And you say, what is a genre? That just means it's a different types of literature. So for example, in the Bible, we have a number of different types. You've got narratives, you've got poetry, you have uh, what we'd call a prophetic writing. It would probably be sometimes better just called more like exhortations or sermons. You have letters. Uh, the Old Testament, you have books that are considered law. Uh, you have wisdom literature. The way that you would interpret those, those rules are going to be modified slightly and sometimes drastically. So if someone is using a metaphor to explain something to you, well, you, you wouldn't interpret it as fact. You understand they're trying to explain a concept to you. So when you think about whether you have parables, you have even sometimes we find hyperbole, other approaches in the scripture to, to communicate something, you, the key is, is you want to get to the meaning of the text. To get to the meaning of the text, you have to understand what type of text you're dealing with here. And once you understand it, for example, if we were interpreting the Psalms, well, that's, it's poetic, it's poetry, so we'd have to talk about the use of imagery, uh, how the imagery would affect the meaning, how the lines uh, either complement or contrast one another. So there, the rules could go on and on and on as we talk about it. But I think it's important for you to identify, first of all, what type of literature. So is it historical narrative, for example, the Gospels or the Book of Acts? Uh, also, you have letters. So the epistles, if you notice, they're, they're written a certain way. I think that's where we start. That kind of helps you understand the, the way you're, that the author's communicating. For example, if I'm communicating to my wife and I'm using flowery language, I'm communicating that I love her in very flowery language, well, that, that, that's interpreted. I'm using metaphors. I'm, I'm using hyperbole so that she can understand what I really mean. Now, I could also say it in a very plain manner. Like, for example, I could say, I just, I love you in a very straightforward way. And, it's, and what, what we discover is I'm actually saying the same thing. I'm just saying it two different ways. So I think that's why it's important. And so let's use the, uh, the letters as an example, one of the epistles. Now, you think about it. One of the things you need to understand is try to understand is the audience or the context. So when you look at a text, I think it's important for us to recognize this is a very important principle, that the Bible wasn't written to us. However, it was written for us and for every successive generation. The danger when we go to a letter, particularly an epistle, and I think of the book of Ephesians, uh, we have to be careful not to read ourselves into it. If we're going to understand the meaning of the text, that requires us to understand something about the context. How in the world would we understand the, the, the importance of the issues that are being addressed or the doctrine that's being explained? Now, Ephesians is a little different than the other letters, and it doesn't address any particular personal problems within the church. And it's probably because it's more of a general letter to those churches in that area. If you notice on the front end, there's doctrine in the first three chapters, and in chapters four through six, there's application of that doctrine for Christians and within the believing community. So when you think about a letter, one of the things you want to recognize is that there is a context in which that was written. So if we're going to understand what the imagery that Paul's using, not only do we have to understand the context, that is what's going on in, the, in Ephesus, what is it like to live there during the first century? The other thing we have to also understand is the background, the author's background. So we have the Apostle Paul who's writing. Well, here he is a, he is a Jew who was trained in the Old Testament. He understands the use of some of that imagery. He understands the use of, of, of the text in a way of seeing the fulfillment in Christ and his church. So it's important that we, we are well-versed in the narratives of Scripture. We need to make sure that we are very familiar with the way scripture uses shadows and types. For example, you say shadows and types, that sounds complex. Well, let me just give you an example. You think about like the temple in the Old Testament. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus is presented as the new temple. We see that in John's gospel. That would come out in the book of Ephesians. I think of other examples, we would see a shadow or type in the priesthood in the Old Testament. That comes out in the book of Hebrews as Jesus fulfills that. We can think about the Passover lamb in the Old Testament as a shadow or type. We can go to John's gospel and we can see that Christ is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So you can see why it's important to, have a, to be grounded in the Old Testament, to be 
you know, I wouldn't say an expert in the Old Testament. No, that's not the requirement, but to know the Old Testament story, to know the images, images, know the shadows and types. It's very important because if not, as Paul is using those or what, whoever the author is, whether it's Peter or Paul, Jude, James, as they're using those images, they're, they're using them in a way that was understood uh, not, not necessarily only by their audience, though their audience may have, but certainly by many of their contemporaries, that is, those who early Christian uh, converts, those Jews who became Christians very early on. They were, they were well-versed and saturated in that world. So you say, well, that's just a lot for me to try to understand the Bible. Well, it's worth it. It's worth it. So as you're reading through and you're becoming more and more familiar with the story of the Bible and the themes within the Bible, it's going to help you as you are reading uh, throughout any particular book of the Bible. I think about reading through the book of Psalms. I think it's very important to understand the book of Genesis and the creation uh, the, and the rebellion that is the fall and that, that kind of that motif as I'm reading through the book of Psalms. But also I'm going to need to be versed in uh, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings so that I can kind of have a context for what's going on during that era. So as you become more versed in and more familiar with the Old Testament, it's going to help you reading the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, and I would also say the letters as well. So not only are we recognizing the genre, we need to be familiar with the context, we need to be familiar with, with the author's background. That's why it's important to know who the author is, because you know their background. Now these are things you could, you could find in a study Bible. Now I'm not saying I recommend a study Bible, or you could get an uh, introductory commentary that would help you. And so as you understand uh, what's going on in the world, who's writing and who they're writing to, you also want to try to grasp the purpose. Now many commentaries will try to tell you the purpose. Well, that's the author, what he believes the purpose is. One of the things I think is important is that if you want to read a book of the Bible, just read it. If you really want to understand and get the meaning of a particular book, for example, let's use Ephesians, why wouldn't you just keep reading it? So if, if you've read through it and you don't understand it and you don't understand the meaning, then why not stay with it until you do? So let me encourage, I've been encouraging people to do this. Some people like to read through the whole Bible in a year and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I've encouraged my kids to do that over the years. I've done it several times. But I don't believe that's something that is healthy if you're just doing it every year over and over and over, unless you're supplementing it with, you're focused on reading one or two books of the Bible all the way through over and over and over until you feel like you fully understand uh, the argument. It's going to be interesting. You might say, well, I'm not trained in theology. I'm not trained in hermeneutics. You would be surprised if you read a book of the Bible. Start with something smaller like Ephesians or maybe, maybe Philippians or Colossians. Start with something that you can manage, something that's four to six chapters, and read it over and over and over. Uh, in the years past, I have, I've taken books of the Bible and, and read through them sometimes 20 to 30 times uh, before I feel like I really understand it. Now that may take me, each reading through may take sometimes a day, two or three days, but what happens is I'm coming back through over and over, I'm becoming more familiar with the text. And what that's gonna help me do, it's gonna help me to understand the author's main point and follow his line of thinking, follow his logic as he's making his case. If you notice, I already pointed out in Ephesians, you have the first three chapters are doctrine and the last three chapters are application. How did I come to that? Well, if when you're reading through it, uh, you will see that. And certainly in chapter three, there's, there's some application there as well, but I, I think that's just an easy way to divide it. Beyond that, now as you get into the text itself, one of the things you wanna look for while you're reading through the text over and over is look for key words. Over the years, I've sat down uh, with young men who are either called to the ministry or just wanna grow in the Lord and we will put together a study guide for a particular book of the Bible. I've done this several times, where they, we will work together collectively on putting together a study guide. I know we did this for, uh, I did it for Malachi, and uh, off the top of my head, I can't remember. There were at least two other times that I, that I worked through a book of the Bible and did that. I also did it with uh, Philippians, and I believe Colossians as well. Uh, we worked through the material together and one of them we actually printed the study guide and the other two we used it as a, for our own personal study. One of the things I, I encourage them to do, and this is, and these are not individuals who were seminary trained. These were, we would say, lay people. You know, your everyday Christian uh, 
Uh, so what I did is I walked through and I said, what I want you to do is you're reading through the text over and over. And I, I encourage them actually, in this part, I encourage them not to get a study Bible. I think that's important. We called it a clean Bible. That's what we called them in seminary. You had to have a clean Bible. If you had an exam and you needed to have a Bible present, it had to be clean. You couldn't have notes written in it. It couldn't be a study Bible. So I'd have them get what we call a clean Bible. And I would have them read through it over and over and over. And I would have them make a list of the key words and phrases that they find popping up over and over, uh, things that are being repeated. Or you might even think um, uh, if you're reading through a narrative like a gospel, key figures, key concepts, writing them over and over, or, well, writing them as you're reading over and over and you're beginning to kind of grasp what, what's important to the author, especially things that are being repeated, uh, things that are being highlighted. So as you read through the text, that's what you're looking for. And you say, well, at first it's hard. It's hard for me to understand the text. Well, that's because you, the first time you read something, you shouldn't expect to master it. That's why that we're going to be disciplined about this. If we want to get to the meaning of the text, we have to get to the authorial intent. We need to try to understand the particular purpose. We understand the, of course, we understand the audience and the occasion. You know, try to understand the purpose. And also in that, I have them write down. I want to encourage you to do this as well. And let me know if, if I can help you as you're, as you're working through a text. Because I think this is important. Because so many people have been taught, you know, a handful of doctrines, a handful of beliefs, and then just, you know, given a few verses to defend those beliefs. Versus actually going into the Bible and allowing the Bible to inform your beliefs and working through it faithfully and being faithful uh, in, in handling the word right. So when you think about faithfulness and handling the word right, I guess there's two ways that can be looked at. One might say, well, I'm handling the, the Bible correctly based on the things I was taught. Well, certainly I, I, I respect that, but I respectfully disagree. Now, not that, not that everything you were taught was wrong, but everything you were taught should be, should be clearly uh, informed by the scripture. In fact, you should be able to, not even looking for what you were taught, if it's true, you'll just be able to see it clearly in the scripture. You, you're not going to have to go hunt for it. it it's going to be clearly there. I don't think proof texting is the way to go when we're reading the Bible. That is, go find a verse that supports what you already believe. I think we have to consistently work through the text, trying to discover the meaning of the text, even if that means it challenges our presuppositions. Because here's the thing, truth will stand. If what we believe is already taught in the scripture and it's truth, it will stand, and not only will it stand, it will be solidified in our minds. We, we will have a better understanding of it and deeper conviction about it. So as we think about working through the text, looking for theological themes, we should be writing those down as, as we're going through. What are, what are some of the key theological concepts we find just repeated over and over and over? Look for big theological words. You're going to find terms running throughout the scripture. Of course, you should be making a note if there's a word you don't understand. Be writing. You should write down that word. That way, you can look it up later. And so, I would have these these young brothers work through writing out theological themes, writing out key words, reading through it. And then here's something that most Christians don't practice. What will be very very beneficial for you? You say, well, I just need it easier. I just need to read a verse and have somebody who's written two or three paragraphs that explains the verse and gives me something for today. Well, that's somebody giving you a fish. See, that's different. When you teach someone how to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. So I realize that, well, it's, it's sometimes it's just easier just to have someone give us a fish. Well, they feed us for today. What if you were able to take these skills and not only feed yourself spiritually, but also be able to feed others? See, because if you take that old analogy, you give a man a fish, you feed him for today, you, you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime, you can take that a step farther. You teach him how to fish, and he can feed his family for a lifetime. That's, that's very powerful. So thinking about that, I encourage those who have walked through a study with me where we started from scratch. In fact, part of one of the rules that I've had is that we don't actually read commentaries at all until we're finished to see where there may be some agreement or disagreement or we may need some correction, is to outline the text. You say, well, I just, I just don't have time for that. Well, let me push back. You have time for the things that you make a priority for. Most people have time for hours on social media, hours wasted on um, scrolling through uh, information that is useless. Most people have plenty of time to watch television, 
um, getting on the phone and carrying on or other things. What if you were to take 15 minutes a day, even 20 minutes, maybe even 30 minutes a day, and you're reading through, let's say Ephesians, you're reading through Ephesians over and over and over, and then you start to put together a little outline in one sentence statements. What's that paragraph about? What's that paragraph about? What's that paragraph about? And you work all the way through and you write those out. Well, you'd already written out what you think kind of is the main purpose or the theological theme that's running throughout. Now you're going to be able to kind of see, is it, does that right? Were you correct? Uh, do you find that argument? And then you're also going to kind of see the flow of the author's argument so that if there's a particular verse where you maybe struggled with understanding or meaning, as you're seeing the flow of argument, you're able then to understand it in light of the entire text versus pulling it out and infusing meaning into it that would otherwise be incorrect. This is the surefire way to protect against proof texting. That is when you're consistently working through the text. Now you might say, I don't have time to sit down and write it out. Well, why, why not take the time? Why not just get a small biblical journal and as you're working through a book of the Bible, because certainly this is going to help us, we want to talk about later about other things like praying through the Bible, uh, the spiritual discipline of reading the Bible, of memorizing the Bible. Certainly that, that would be something we'd want to include in the conversation, not for today. But I, I think if you say, okay, I want to know what a verse means. Well, I wouldn't start there. I don't think that's ever where we should start. And we shouldn't start as, as trying to interpret the text. I recently had a class I was teaching on interpreting the Psalms. And one of the things I noticed with students, their default is to immediately try to interpret the text, uh, whatever it is. And I, I said, that's, that's not where we start. What we start is we start with trying to gain an understanding of these key things, the type of literature, uh, the, the audience, the author, looking for theological themes, looking for repeated things that are coming up, kind of key words, key concepts over and over, and then following kind of the flow of the text. And once we've done that, then I think we're at the place where we can, we can try to faithfully say, this is what the author intended, this is what the inspired author meant to the closest degree that we possibly can. And then from there, we can find application. You might say, man, this just feels like a lot. Well, it actually isn't. If you would just start with this, so as a wrap up, let me encourage you, here's how we start. Pick a book of the Bible and just start reading through it every day. Now you may not get through it all in one day, so this may be something that you're doing over several days. If you pick a smaller book, you should be able to do it in one to two days, reading it over and over. Do that, try that to do at least 12 times. And then all of a sudden you're gonna recognize, wait a minute, I feel like I'm starting to understand. Then you're gonna to wanna to go a little farther. And in going farther, certainly you wanna understand the audience, the author, the context, the author's background, but then you also begin to just, even if you're not writing them down, you'll be able to start recognizing key concepts, key words, theological themes running throughout the text. And as you do that, you'll start following and seeing the flow of the text. That's gonna provide you a safeguard over and against in proper interpretation. Now, it's not an absolute safeguard, but it's a first level safeguard over and against reading something into the text. Well, what, you know, why does all this matter? Here's why it matters. The Bible's the Word of God. It's the inspired Word of God. It, it's not inspired. The, the, the Bible's inspired, but our interpretation of it is not inspired. So the text has a meaning. The goal isn't to promote our interpretation of the text, but it's to discover the meaning of the text. Because in discovering the meaning of the text, then we're hearing the Word of God. And then we can faithfully, with God's help and by His grace, apply the Word to our lives. And applying the Word to our lives, we are faithfully serving the Lord Jesus Christ and being used as instruments of His grace. Well, until the nations are converted, let us be faithful at handling the Word correctly. But also, there can be no excuses. Don't make any excuses. None, none are worthy of our Lord. Get in your Word, get in the Bible, and begin to to work through truly understanding it. There'll be absolutely no retreat and no surrender. Why? Because Jesus Christ is King. 